Dean Banks, by authorization of the university and the College of Law faculties, I declare the year 2016 commencement exercises of the Syracuse University College of Law to be in session. Please stand for the national anthem, which will be performed today by Gabriella Wolf from the class of 2016. Vice President Biden, Chancellor Siverud, members of the Syracuse University Board of Trustees, College of Law Board of Advisors, faculty and staff colleagues, friends and family of the graduates, and finally, members of the class of 2016, welcome to the commencement ceremony for the JD and LLM candidates in the class of 2016. Graduates, please stand. Now, I want you to turn around and give a big shout out and a hearty round of applause to the family and friends and loved ones who have brought you to this day today. Okay, you may be seated. In my brief remarks today, I have a few things that I want to say about the class of 2016. I've been a member of the faculty of the College of Law for a long time, and it may be that I paid closer attention to all of you this year because I've been serving as your interim dean, but even allowing for my biased perspective, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that the accomplishments of the class of 2016 rival those of any class in the history of Syracuse University College of Law. <laughs> you guys rock. One of your distinctions, of course, is being the last graduating class to have spent a year in our old buildings before transitioning to Deneen Hall. You've tolerated the move, you've thrived in and embraced your new surroundings. What a difference. Your class president, Dustin Osborne, will speak about the class gift and the terrific story that laid, led to it. I'll lay the foundation for Dustin by saying that this year was the College of Law's first time participating in the Syracuse University Class Act Student Giving Initiative. 
In this first year of participation, all of you, the College of Law class of 2016, ended the year with the highest percentage of participation among graduating students in any college at Syracuse University. You guys rock. <clears throat> Through your support of the college, you've created a legacy. Legacy is important. A legacy serves to inspire and to challenge us to work hard and excel in whatever we do. If you look around us here today, you'll see some of our best exemplars. The Vice President of the United States, members of our faculty and staff, Syracuse University trustees, College of Law advisory and alumni board members, they are part of a living legacy. Through their generosity, they have provided scholarship support for many of you, just as your generosity will support our law students in the future. Earlier this year, I established the Bo Biden Scholarship Fund to honor the legacy of my former student, our friend and alumnus, Bo Biden, from the class of 1994. Our College of Law community members have once again come together to further fund the scholarship, including two of our alumni here today, Richard Alexander and Chris Fallon. We have created a lasting tribute to Bo, reflecting his impact on the College of Law, as well as Bo's significant accomplishments in public life. I'm pleased to announce that our first Bo Biden scholar is Natasha Fodor from the class of 2017. <clears throat> Focusing again now on our JD graduates, you participated in some remarkable programs and initiatives this year, to name just a few. Several INSKIT students worked on the Syria Accountability Project and produced a white paper helping to document for the future justice initiatives against those responsible for the atrocities committed against civilians in that horrific conflict. Others of you participated in the Veterans Law Clinic and helped provide legal services to this richly deserving and underserved segment of our society. Others of you participated in the DC externship program, a popular and rewarding semester-long experience working in government, business, or law firms in Washington, DC. Just a few weeks ago, our law review students hosted the National Conference of Law Review's annual three-day conference for over 45 schools in Deneen Hall, attended by over 160 students. The NCLR is a very prestigious event and included excellent panel discussions and presentations by Chancellor Kent Siverud and Yale Law Professor Eugene Fidel. At around the same time, I received a phone call at home on a Friday night, notifying me that one of our three L's, Corey Schoonmaker, was one of 10 national winners of the Burton Award, perhaps the most prestigious award given to students for their legal writing. Corey will attend an awards dinner in Washington where the speakers include Supreme Court Justices Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Stephen Breyer. Then there are our award-winning moot court teams. To name just a few highlights, the National Moot Court Competition Boston Regional, our three L's earned Best Brief and Best Advocate. In the St. John's Securities Triathlon, our students won the Advocate's Choice Award. Our three L's also won awards at the Jessup International Moot Court Competition, the Hockey Arbitration Competition of Canada, the Thurgood Marshall Competition, and the National Trial Competition. Turning to our LLM class, they also had some remarkable milestone achievements this year. Again, to name just a few, one of our December 2015 graduates Goran Aljaf met with the Vice President's security advisor to discuss the Yazidi genocide and the enslavement of Yazidi women. 
During his visit, Goran presented to the White House staff a paper he'd written on the crisis with ISIS, including his recommendations for how the International Criminal Court could bring those ISIS leaders to justice. LLM student Dima Hussein and graduate Raoula Janid, both also originally from Syria, participated in a panel discussion on the Syrian refugee crisis, sharing their perspectives on the conflict based on personal experiences. In February, the LLM class staged a silent vigil in the Levy Atrium of Deneen Hall to raise awareness of the Syrian conflict and the human rights abuses occurring there. JD students, faculty, and staff joined in the vigil in solidarity with their cause. Finally, several LLM students have spent the year volunteering for the Syracuse University Program for Refugee Assistance, teaching English and working with refugees on their transition into life in America. I'm going to close with a very short story and with sincere congratulations to all of you and all who have helped you toward this moment of accomplishment. The story goes like this. There was a businessman who had ordered a floral bouquet to be sent to the grand opening of a friend's new branch office. When he arrived at the grand opening ceremony, he found, much to his dismay, that the flowers had arrived with a card that said, rest in peace. Well, the next day, embarrassed and slightly angry, he called the florist to complain, only to be told by a very quick-witted florist, don't worry, just think of it this way. Somewhere in town yesterday, some poor soul was buried under a sign that said, good luck in your new location. <laughs> That's what I wish you now, good luck in all your new locations. It's my pleasure now to introduce Dustin Osborne, who serves as the class president for the class of 2016. Dustin is also an associate notes editor of the Syracuse Law Review and has been a student mentor. Dustin. He's a little taller. Thank you, Dean Banks, Mr. Vice President, faculty, staff, administration, distinguished guests, family and friends, and of course, the beautiful graduating class of 2016. I would first especially like to thank the Vice President for taking some of the pressure off me today. Once my boss heard that the Vice President was going to be our commencement speaker, he asked me to make sure I got an autograph. I told him that I would also be speaking and be sure to sign a program for him, and he said he'd have to fire me. So I'm guessing they didn't print tickets today so that you could hear me talk. In all seriousness, I am honored to have the privilege to stand before you. The class of 2016 is an amazing class, and they're gonna accomplish incredible things upon leaving today as graduates. I've known for a while now I had the daunting task of uh, giving this speech at commencement, so I asked around to advice, uh, and it was to no avail. Most of the faculty and staff who had gone through these commencements uh, multiple times essentially said the same thing. The carrier dome, ironically, doesn't have air conditioning, so just keep it brief and wear as little clothing as you can get away with. So don't worry, I will in fact keep it short and sweet, just like me. Um, but first, I would like to turn everyone's attention over to the College of Law faculty. I've always thought of law school of being like the beginning of a jungle where you're given a machete and you carve your own path. And these are the people that teach us how to cut. The Res Ipsa Locator Award is our class's opportunity to thank a special member of the faculty. Res Ipsa Locator is a Latin phrase that means the thing speaks for itself. Since the award's inception in 2005, each graduating class has recognized a member of the faculty whose tireless devotion and contributions to the students truly speaks for itself. This year's recipient has done some astounding things both for students and the College of Law as a whole. A graduate of Yale and Harvard Law, he has run the extraordinary low-income taxpayer clinic 
since its founding in 2002. Perhaps more impressively, he found a way to make students fascinated with tax law. Uh, while I did not have the privilege of having him as a professor during school, the students who have describe him as brilliant, engaging, and quote, who I want to be when I grow up. Although, that may be because I hear he has a vote. Additionally, this year's recipient's history with this award is beginning to speak for itself. Not only has he won it twice previously, but in a triennial fashion, winning it every three years. So we'll watch out in 2019. Everyone, please join me in congratulating this year's recipient of the Res Ipsa Loquitur Award, Professor Robert Nassau. Next, I want to briefly talk about the legacy that our class began this year, the class gift. It all started with an alumni breakfast held during orientation this past fall. I was randomly assigned to a table at the breakfast with Alan Epstein. And after we finished talking about our love for college football, he said, so Dustin, you're a 3 -L. I have an idea that I want to get started with this graduating class. But I guess this is really more of a conversation I need to have with your class president. And that's why I had to interrupt him and say, it's funny you should mention that. Uh, so we got to talking, and he wanted to work with me and our class to start the class gift fund, the proceeds of which would go to a scholarship for a student who would not otherwise receive one. I am proud to announce that in the inaugural year of the class gift, our class raised $3,650.10 for this fund. In addition, with the generous offers from both Alan Epstein and Melanie Gray to match this amount, the total comes to $10,950.30. And most incredibly, about 81% of our graduating class participated in this donation, which is truly remarkable. So. And finally, to the class of 2016, what a ride. I know that the one thing you're all sad about on this special day is the fact that you won't be receiving as many emails from me. But don't worry, I'm sure I'll find a way. As if law school wasn't enough of a whirlwind, our class had the chance to experience some events that other classes can't say. We started a legacy with the Class Gift Fund. We hosted the National Conference of Law Reviews this past year. We are the last class that experienced the dungeon-esque feel of the old building. We had the privilege of having two esteemed deans at our law school and helped to welcome in a third. We began our first basketball season 25-0 and, and ended with the men's and women's Final Fours. And we did what they said was impossible and convinced the vice president to come to our school not just once, but twice. <laughs> with all of these transitions and challenges that occurred during our law school tenure, it truly was a grind. But life is hard because it's worth it. We have accomplished so incredibly much over the last three years, cementing our status as the greatest class in history. I have no doubt that we can make amazing things happen after today. Finally, for those of you who know me really well know I have an odd affinity for new and impressive words because, as you all know, law school turns you into a big nerd. I came across one recently that made me think of our class in a really endearing way. The word is obstreperous, and it means noisy and difficult to, con difficult to control. And I think we should embrace that. With this degree, let's go out there, rock the bar, be obstreperous and successful, and make history in whatever our passions may be, and continue to cut through that jungle to make our paths and lives extraordinary. Congratulations, class of 2016. As Associate Dean for International Initiatives and Executive Director of the LLM, it's my pleasure to introduce our LLM class speaker, Ahmed Hamidat. Please come to the stage. Ahmed is the leader. Ahmed is a leader and will be giving our first LLM speaker at commencement. 
and we're very excited. Thank you so much. Wow. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to so many great and talented folks. And thank you for allowing me to be the alum spokesperson at this event. My name is Ahmed Ahmedat, and I want to congratulate all the alum students, my fellows, and the GDs graduates and their families. Also, I would like to welcome our distinguished guest, the Vice President of the United States, and thank him for making this event one we'll never forget. Also, many thanks for our professors, the alum professors, the faculty staff, and alum mentors for being so important in our journey that we complete here today. We are the alum student came to the US from 16 different countries around the world. In order to study one, must, one, one year master degree in US law, and all of us, already lawyers, or let's say most of us, business attorneys from Saudi Arabia, Nicaragua, Colombia, Azerbaijan and Spain, human rights advocates from Palestine, Syria, Ethiopia, South Sudan, Kenya, and Peru, and litigators from Brazil, India, Turkey, and South Korea, and Iraq. When we came, when we started this program one year ago, I assume we had no idea what we are going to do. I assume all of us love the law. When, when we came to Syracuse University and United States, we were expecting to meet U.S. citizens, and we did. But guess who knew that we would make friends from all over the world? We came to study because we believe in the rule of law as one of the most effective mechanisms to develop our communities achieve justice and empower human rights. Ladies and gentlemen, let me share with you my personal story here at this ceremony. I grew up in a refugee camp in Palestine near Jerusalem. And when I was in high school, in, in high school back in the days, my favorite subject was to study law because I believe that the rule of law and the development of a, a strong civil, unoccupied society was what my country needed the most. Later on, I concluded that the practice of law requires courage. In this respect, I admire what the Vice President has done in issues like health, immigration. He really has been such a leader. I want to invite him to come to my refugee camp next year and join us in our struggle. It would be great. Coming from, where I come, coming from where I come from, a refugee camp established in 1948, and living under the law of occupation in, in Palestine, my experience of law was different, totally different. My experience of law was to see it as the tool of the powerful, to keep the colonies in subjection. But what I and my colleagues, we learned here from our professors at the Alam program, that the practice of law is that, that the true law is about liberty and that all of us, lawyers, politicians, members of civil society, we all have the duty to ensure that the law protects justice, that the law is not equal, is equal to tyranny. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been a wonderful year. When we all leave Syracuse University, College of Law changed and ready to promote the rule of law in, ex in the next chapter of our lives where this ne next chapter may take us. Ladies and gentlemen, let me finish by singling out one of the best professors who had a great and splendid impact on our alumni class. For the first time ever, the alumni student voted for their favorite professor in order to award this person the loose lux mondum. Yeah, I hope I said it right. <laughs>
to award this person this award at this ceremony. In fact, all our faculty, they are outstanding, but among them all, the class voted for one professor. This professor, he's the director of the LAM program and taught our commercial transaction course, the course that we love the most. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I would like for Aviva Apromot to step forward and receive the Congratulations, Professor Apromaski. It has been a wonderful year. It's a pleasure and honor for all of us, and thank you. Thank you. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our commencement speaker, Joe Biden, the Vice President of the United States. <clears throat> A few minutes ago, I spoke about the important service, giving back, of working hard to achieve your goals. There's no one in modern American life who more personifies those essential qualities than Vice President Biden. Of course, the Vice President owes a portion of the success and achievements he has had to the legal education he received at Syracuse University College of Law. Many of you know that the Vice President was a member of the class of 1968, having entered with a half scholarship based on financial need with some additional assistance based on his academics. Having developed an abiding interest in history and politics as an undergraduate student, the future Vice President learned in law school about the capacity of law and the legal process as agents of positive change in society. After he moved with his family to Wilmington, Delaware to begin practicing law, Senator Biden soon was attracted to electoral politics, and in 1972, he became the fifth youngest person ever elected to the United States Senate. Knowing what we now know about the Vice President, it should come as no surprise that his Senate campaign was given virtually no chance of winning, that he had no money for his campaign, and that his sister and other family members ran and staffed his campaign. From 1973 to 2009, Senator Biden served as an especially distinguished United States Senator. He became one of the body's leading experts on foreign policy, spearheading important U.S. accomplishments and speaking out against our missteps. He was also a tireless advocate for the rule of law in his role as chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee. It was there that Senator Biden undertook the long-term project that produced the Violence Against Women Act. As Vice President, Joe Biden has stood tall. He's masterfully navigated difficult congressional currents to gain approval for key legislative initiatives sponsored by the White House. He's also used some of the skills that he learned at the College of Law, enforcing careful consideration of all sides of an argument or policy position in meetings with the President and his advisors in the White House. I came to know Joe Biden in the early 1990s when his son, Bo, was my student, our college student. I was enrolled in my national security law course, and when his dad came to visit, Joe would sometimes speak to my national security law class. I believe in those days it was about the Balkans or perhaps the first Gulf War. Soon thereafter, I worked for Senator Biden, and I came to appreciate what is now so widely known and understood about the Vice President, that he responds to real people and their problems, and that he is selflessly committed to service for the public good. Syracuse University has also long known that our alumnus was a signal figure in modern American life. In 1980, SU conferred on Senator Chancellor's Medal, 
in 2005, the George Arendt's Pioneer Medal, the highest alumni award at Syracuse University for his excellence in public affairs, and in 2009, an honorary degree to go along with his JD. Finally, it gave me great pleasure to say that I'm a friend of someone who is a friend of Lady Gaga. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the President, Vice President of the United States. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. You're very gracious. Thank you. I know I'm doing all right when the band stands. Thank you, gentlemen. You know, uh, I say to the parents and grandparents and siblings, uh, you'd think Syracuse would have learned by now. This is the fifth time Biden has addressed the commencement. I guess it's trouble getting anybody else to come. I, it's a great honor to be invited back. Dean Banks, uh, thank you, not for the introduction, but for your friendship. And to the faculty and staff, thank you for your service for this great institution. I mean that sincerely. To the chagrin of some of my professors, I actually taught for 21 years at Delaware Law School, uh, an advanced course in constitutional law and separation of powers. And uh, so I would not be accused of having any conflict. I taught it on Saturday mornings. It was a three-hour course, three-credit course. And it satisfied for the writing requirement. And even though I literally wrote the manuscript because I had some considerable experience in separation of powers and with the help of Dean Banks and as chairman of the judiciary of the both Judiciary and Foreign Relations Committee, I, there wasn't a single class I taught, and I did it for 19 years, that I didn't spend three hours preparing, either the night before or up early in that morning. So uh, my wife's a professor. She uh, is a doctor at, uh, she has her doctorate. She teaches at a community college. and. Uh, um, Took the job, thinking that maybe I wasn't going to, and this was 20 years ago, and I might want to teach. But I realized you really have to work, and my day job was better. Um, but thank you for your dedication. I really mean it. I genuinely, genuinely mean it. And the class of 2016, but before, I, before I talk about you guys, I want to talk a little bit about those folks behind you. Be nice to them. You may need them to pay off your college, your law school loans. You may need their help. To the parents and grandparents and spouses, all who helped, it is an enormous sacrifice, an enormous cost uh, to get a graduate degree at any institution, a law degree at any institution. And uh, I, uh, I, I, I know you'll all, you all believe today that whatever part you played in that effort was worth it. Because uh, as my dad would say, who never went to college, I'd ask him all the time why he thought it was so important I get a college degree and a law degree. He said, because they can never take it from you. I never fully understood that until I got older and realized what my father said, which was what you've learned, what you know, both uh, equips you but also prevent you from rationalizing about things you might otherwise want to do that are easier. And so I say to the class of 2016, uh, um, you made it. 11 of winter and two weeks of fall and two weeks of spring. Uh, I remember. Uh, I remember I told the Dean this. I, I don't want to, I guess I should have started telling stories because it'll take too long, but my son, Bo, was my soul. My son, Bo, I talked to him every single day. And uh, he called me his senior year. It was April the 13th. I used to always brag about, tell my kids a story about the blizzard of 66, 60 inches of snow here in Syracuse for real, 100 inches at Watertown. And I'd tell my kids and then my grandkids that story. So 
October the 13th, early in the morning, I got a call from my son. He never called in the morning. I said, what's the matter, honey? He said, no, nothing, Dad. I just walked up from Genesee. He said, uh, he said I, uh, I just want you to know it's April 13th. It was Friday, April 13th. I thought he was going to make some joke about it being unlucky. I said, you know, everything unlucky for everyone else is lucky for Biden's. And he said, yeah, Dad, but he said, it's April 13th. They just announced I'm in the law school lounge. 13 inches of snow has fallen today. And then he said, and they announced, Dad, that more snow has fallen this year than any time in recorded history. I think it was 198 inches. Don't hold me to the number. And then he said, Dad, I now own the snow stories. <laughs> so not only did you make it through the winter, you climbed out of the dungeon into the Neen Hall. You actually have sunlight. No more wheel of terror. No more nightmares. Professor Lampe would, uh, Lampe would be calling on you in class. <laughs> I had uh, a similar experience with a professor named Alexander, who was my torch professor. Because I was a scholarship student, I got to take role and sat all the way in the back. No one was ever absent. Uh, and, uh, um, and everybody dreaded being called on by Professor Alexander. And uh, I had not prepared all that well. As a matter of fact, I'm embarrassed to say I hadn't even bought, purchased the book yet. And uh, I was in the back of class, and I had a great friend named Clayton Hale, who lived here as a lawyer here, a brilliant guy who I'd always be able to borrow Clay's notes on the way home. And, uh, and so uh, he called on me. I didn't know, I hadn't read the case. I stood up and I gave a 10 minutes exposition on the case. And when I finished, the entire class stood and applauded. And the president of the the guy who graduated at number one in our class, wanted to become the managing partner of Solomon Cromwell, said, uh, um, reminded everyone when he supported me running for president, he said, and the professor looked at Biden and said, you know, Mr. Biden, you'll probably become a very good advocate. It's obvious you don't know a damn thing you're saying, but you spellbound the class for 10 minutes. That sort of summarizes my career at Syracuse. I, uh, but it's a genuine, it's a true story, unfortunately. He went on to be dean of a law school on the West Coast. It's a genuine honor to be back at a place I love. A law school where I made incredible friends who have lasted my whole life, including my best friend, Jack Owens, who ended up becoming my law partner, and then my brother-in-law. Bob Osgood, Don Parsons, Clay Hale, Eddie Moses, Joe Watt, John Cavino, Don McNaughton, who named the uh, facility after his mom, and so many others. This law school educated and stood by me throughout my career. Professor Tom Maroney, I don't know, whether he, I told he may be here, one of the finest guys I've ever known. And where are you, Tom? Stand up, man. Stand up. Professor's not only a man of great integrity, he convinced me that I could be whatever I wanted to be. The only reason anybody ever questioned his judgment is he gave me an A in his course. Uh, and uh, guys like Sam Donnelly, who taught here for 42 years or 44 years, who we lost last year, a Dean Karras, a Dean Miller, too many others to mention. Uh, they uh, did everything for me. They helped me. Dean Miller's, uh, I, uh, they helped me get my first job in the law. I'll never forget the concluding line in Dean Miller's recommendation letter he wrote to me. I'm serious. It said, you'll be indeed fortunate if you get Mr. Biden to work for you. Um, he never lied. Um, my classmates and my professors literally helped me get elected to the United States Senate at age 29. I was not able to be sworn in uh, until uh, I was uh, till legally 13 days later. This school, this law school, my faculty, my friends, 
embraced me with open arms when, six weeks later after being elected, my wife and daughter were killed when a tractor trailer broadsided them and my two sons were not expected to live. They were with me. When I announced I wasn't going to be sworn in, two of my professors came to see me, encouraging me, telling me there are only 1,720 people in American history who had ever been elected to the United States Senate, and I had an obligation to my wife and my family because they worked so hard. The fact is that um, when I launched my first presidential bid in 1988, a number of my colleagues and a couple of professors actually drove to Wilmington and got on the train and rode with me to my, they were there with my announcement as I announced in Wilmington and rode with me to Washington as I announced on the national stage as well. They uh, embraced me. And they embraced me when I lost, as if I had won. As if I had won. They supported me in uh, seven winning campaigns for the United States Senate, and two as Vice President. The type of loyalty that this school has extended to me is truly rare and genuinely welcoming. It was the same for my, my son, Bo, who loves Syracuse as well. You embraced him when he enrolled here, not as a senator's son, but as Bo Biden on his own terms. You prepared him to be a great lawyer, which he was, and a young attorney general, two terms. He made great friends here, as I did. George, the two Chris's, Andy, Joe, Lisa Marie, Natalie. Actually, he had an advantage over me. Half his class, like this class, was women. We only had one woman in our graduating class. And the profession is so much better off now. The bench is so much more competent now. And the school is so much better now. Some of you may think I'm engaging in hyperbole when I talk about the loyalty. But Bo's friends were there when, as a sitting attorney general, he sought an exception to be able to go with his National Guard unit to Iraq. They literally were there and saw him off when he volunteered to deploy as the Army Brigade Trial Council. And after a year in Iraq, when he came home, as a proud veteran, having been awarded the Bronze Star, the Legion of Merit, the Delaware Conspicuous Service Cross, his law school friends were literally there when he disembarked. They stayed in contact with him when three years ago he was diagnosed with a death sentence of stage four glioblastoma of the brain. They visited him in whatever hospital he was in, whether it was in Texas at one of the great cancer hospitals or at Jefferson in Philadelphia or at Walter Reed at the end. They're still there, looking out for my Bo's children, Natalie and Hunter, and his wife, Hallie. And Dean, the school continues to look out for my boy's memory honoring him today, honoring him today, and the scholarship named after him. The affection for Syracuse Law School runs deep in the Biden family. Two generations approaching three. Dean Banks, on behalf of my son Hunter, who made a mistake and went to Yale Law School, My daughter, Ashley, my wife, Jill, Bo's wife, Hallie, his children, Natalie and Hunter, we are indebted to Syracuse, not only for the support, but the affection it's shown and continues to show to my Bo. 
It would mean a lot to Bo knowing that a deserving student will be able to attend this great law school on a scholarship that has his name attached to it. And those of you who knew him in the audience know I mean that. He would have been proud. He was a good man. He was the finest person I've ever known in my life. In the class of 2016, you're a remarkable class. The best of your generation in a remarkable generation. Again, that's not hyperbole. Your generation is the most tolerant generation ever. And with the intellectual horsepower and the tools to be able to make things happen, to get things done. And now, as you sit there, many of you have or are in the process of deciding, what will you do with all this capability? Like all of you, when I graduated, I felt a similar pressure. What will I do? But the script was written, find the best job with the most prestigious law firm you can. Be in a position to advance, to make good money, become a partner. That's what I did. I landed a job because of the help of my professors with one of the most prestigious law firms in my state, one of the oldest in my state. But the problem was, as I strode across the stage in 1968, the world had changed. Dr. King had been assassinated. There were riots throughout America. A significant part of my hometown of Wilmington, Delaware, was burned to the ground. We became the only city since Reconstruction to be occupied by the military for nine months. The National Guard in every corner with drawn bayonets, state troopers patrolling the neighborhood, not city cops. And I was home with a prestigious job. Because wasn't that what I was supposed to do? Wasn't that what I expected to do? But six months later, I realized that wasn't what I was supposed to do. And to the surprise of the senior partners in my law firm, I walked out of a federal courtroom, catty corner across what they call Rodney Square, the center of town, into the basement of the building on the far corner, and I walked into the public defender's office. And I asked for a job. Remember the guy holding, directing the office, and his name was Franny Kearns. He said, aren't you with? And I said, yes. He said, you're making a big mistake. But like many of your parents, I was lucky just in time. I learned early on what I wanted to do, what made me the happiest family faith, being engaged in the public affairs that gripped my generation when I graduated. The civil rights movement, the environmental movement, the women's movement, ending a bitterly divisive war in Vietnam. Now it's your turn. It's your time. Time to attempt to find that sweet spot where success and happiness intersect. And it's not easy. Some of you will go into uh, and onto powerful law firms on Wall Street, government service, prosecutor's office, public defenders. Some of you will take the knowledge and be successful entrepreneurs representing and represent nonprofits. Some of you will serve in the military. Some of you will go back to your home countries and risk, risk your lives for the rule of law. But all of you will have one thing in common. You'll all have to figure out how to balance success, happiness, and ambition. I've met an awful lot of successful people. I've literally met every major world leader in the last 42 years. 
personally met them. So many others. People who by any standard are considered success. But I've observed, as I've gotten to know many of them, a significant number of them are not happy. I've worked with eight presidents. Only 13 senators have served longer than me in the entirety of American history. Industry leaders, the psychons of Silicon Valley, high-powered lawyers, doctors, nurses, teachers, social workers. And I made several basic observations that I hope will help you. Those who I observed who achieved both success and happiness, those who balanced life and career, those who found purpose and fulfillment, they all understood that there's no silver bullet, no single formula, no reductive list. They all seem to understand that success and happiness do not result from a single thing. They result from an accumulation of thousands of little things with the common features that they built their character. First, the successful and happy people I've come to know understand that a good life at its core is about being personal, being engaged. It's being there for a friend or colleague when they sustain an injury in an accident, remembering to congratulate them on a marriage or birth, being available to them as they're going through personal loss or failure. It's about loving somebody more than you love yourself. It seems to all get down to personal. That's the stuff that fosters relationships and the only stuff that breeds trust in everything you do in life. The way you earn trust. And I mean earn trust. So try to look beyond the character, caricature of a person. Resist the temptation to ascribe motive because the truth is you never know a person's motive. And if you ascribe motive, it makes it incredibly difficult in ever establishing to establish a relationship. It gets in the way. Resist the temptation to let network be a verb that saps the personal away, that blinds you to the person right in front of you, their hopes, their fears, their burdens. Build real relationships, even with people with whom you vehemently disagree. I promise you will not only be happier for it, you will be more successful. Second thing I've observed, they all believe although no one is better than them, everyone is their equal and entitled to be treated with dignity and respect, regardless of their academic or social backgrounds. Think of the people you know who respond to pedigree, who respond to social standing, I've noticed that the ones who had the most success and were most respected were the ones who never confused academic credentials and social sophistication with gravitas or judgment. You know a lot of people who are incredibly bright who lack judgment. They do not necessarily go together. And don't forget about what does not come with your LLM or your JD. And that is the heart to know what is meaningful and what is ephemeral 
and the head to know the difference between knowledge and judgment. The third thing in my experience they all seem to have in common is that they have resisted the temptation to rationalize. My chief of staff and later United States Senator Ted Kaufman, a graduate of the Wharton School, a brilliant guy, every new employee we'd hire, the last thing he'd say to them, never underestimate the ability of the human mind to rationalize, to end up with the ends justifying the means. Ladies and gentlemen, I've seen, as your parents have and you have, so many people rationalize in the name of ambition. Her birthday really doesn't matter that much to her. This business trip is really important. It would be better for both of us. I know this is the last game, but in order to make it, I'd have to take Red Eye back, and he'll understand. We can always take that vacation another time, the one I promised and we planned for six months, because I have an important project to finish. You know it. You do it. Some of you have seen your parents do it. And resist the temptation to rationalize what others view as the right choice for you instead of what you know is right, what feels right, what feels right in your gut based on what's important to you. Let that be your North Star. As I've said at other graduations this year, I know your generation faces an incredible amount of pressure to succeed now that you've accomplished so much. Your whole generation faces the same pressure, this remarkable generation. You race to do what, other th to what others think is the right thing in high school, the right courses to take. You race through the blood sport of college admissions and law school admissions. You race through Syracuse Law, ready for the next big thing. And I know you'll be re reluctant to admit it, but along the way, you compare yourself to the success of your peers on Facebook, Instagram, Lycan, Twitter, Today, some of you may have found that you've slipped into that self-referential bubble that validates certain choices. The bubble that expands once you leave campus, the pressure and anxiousness as well. Take a certain job, live in a certain place, hang out, hang out with the same kind of people. And for God's sake, don't take a real risk that could impact on your career all the time while getting paid with a false sense of both. You have the intellectual horsepower to make things better in the world around you. As I said, you're the most tolerant generation in American history. But intellectual horsepower and tolerance alone do not make a generation great. Unless you can break out of that bubble of your own making technologically, geographically, racially, socioeconomically, truly connect with the world around you. Some of you rationalize you don't need to be engaged. But you can't cordon yourself off from the effects of climate change. When your brother is not allowed to marry the man he loves, you are diminished. You know, I think, and I'm not 
just saying this. I think my son Bo said it best when he was the commencement speaker here as Attorney General in 2011. He said, and I quote, be the guardians of a more complicated truth. That means are as important and sometimes even more important than the ends. He went on to say, you will be lawyers in your profession, but now knowing what you know, you will also be leaders in your community and among your friends and families. In those more private, yet equally challenging courtrooms, you will face a similar cycle of testing and retesting. You know, I'm to say, and you will find peace when there are certain rules that you conclude are not malleable. Your conscience, for one. Your conscience should not be malleable. Your values, for another. They are your means. And along with learning, you now possess these and other things that will guide you." End of quote. He believed, as I do, that you can find balance between ambition and what's really important. You can do both. You can absolutely succeed in life without ever sacrificing your ideals or your commitments to others and family. Heed the words of Justice Brandeis, who wrote, we are not won by arguments that we can analyze, but by tone and temper, by manner, which is man himself. I have had over a thousand young lawyers work for me. At one point, I had 57 lawyers working for me. 21 of whom graduated one or two in their class from the best law schools in America. But there was a difference. There was a difference. They were all ambitious. But some rationalized a lot. For if you work in the service of what matters to you, as Bo said, if you're guardians of the more complicated truth, not only society, but you will be better off for it. I'm not asking for any great sacrifice. I'm not asking for sackcloth, ashes, not making money. You can do both, and we'll all be better off. My wish for you, the graduating class of 2016, is that you're both so successful, but even more importantly, that you're happy in the pursuit of your ambition. Congratulations, class of 2016. I'm proud of you. I'm proud to stand among you as fellow alums. May God bless you, and may God protect our troops. Thank you. I'll now ask Associate Dean Aviva Abramovsky to come forward for the conferral of the LLM degrees. Will the candidates from the class of 2016 for the degree of Masters of Law Please rise. By authority of the Faculty of Law, I have the honor to present the candidates from the class of 2016 who have fulfilled the academic requirements prescribed by the College of Law for the degree of Masters of Laws.
by action of the University Senate, the Board of Trustees concurring, you are hereby conferred the degree of Master of Laws and are admitted to all the rights and privileges thereunto pertaining. The diploma which you will receive is your evidence of this action. Please be seated. I'll now invite Associate Dean Christian Day to come to the podium for conferral of the JD degrees. Will the candidates from the class of 2016 for the degree of Juris Doctor please rise? By the authority of the Faculty of Law, I have the honor to present the candidates of the class of 2016 who have fulfilled the academic requirements prescribed by the College of Law for the degree of Juris Doctor. By action of the University Senate, the Board of Trustees concurring you are hereby conferred the degree of Juris Doctor and are admitted to all the rights and privileges thereunto pertaining. The diploma which you will receive is evidence of this action. The LLM graduates and the Juris Doctor graduates will come forward to be presented by Senior Assistant Dean Tomas Gonzalez and be invested with their hoods by Professors Admiromoski, Anan, Bell, Cantor, Ken, Trufrost, and Turnipsey. Cody J. Carbone, Public Administration. <laughs> Dustin W. Osborne, Cum Laude. Gabriella E. Wolf, Cum Laude. Ahmed Hamida. <laughs> Mustafa Abu Qadir. <laughs> Suleiman Abu Hamed. Faisal Alanazi. Abdul Aziz Alanzi. Abdul Aziz Al Batel. Muhammad Al Harbi. Ryed Al Harbi, <clears throat> Yasmin, 
Yazid Al Harbi. Mohammed Al Koder. Sarah Al Kunezan. Mohammed Al Yani. Usama Al Masro. Mohammed Al Karni. Saleh Al Shunayef. John Appy. Marco Prado. Clauter Duclair. Edmund Gichuru. Wong Ki Hong. Dima Hussein, Jumila Irakut, Young Soon Lee. Samir Mamadou. <laughs> Musa Garawi. <laughs> Max. Pierce Dubouche, Pilar Rodriguez, Silvana Rowe, Javiera Sanchez. Pamela Smith Castro. Sionowet Tafera. Wani Jumi Loku. Sarah T. Ahmed, cum laude. Sarah A. Aksu. Thomas McKee Anderson. Siddharth Ball, Public Relations. Victoria W. Ball, Pro Bono Scholar.
Amanda T. Ball, cum laude. Rachel E. Bangzer, magna cum laude, public relations. Maxwell Q. Bartles, forensic science. Kayla Bodhi, Business Administration. Kevin J. Belby, New Media Management. Danielle K. Blackaby, Pro Bono Scholar. Michael C. Boisvert, magna cum laude. <laughs> Kathleen N. Bowmans. John F. Boyd II. Dime Zach Z. Burnham. Michael J. Bryant. Karen J. Bryson. Eric M. Carlson, cum laude, International Relations. Ana Maria Castillo, International Relations. Katie M. Schmelowick, cum laude, pro bono scholar. Irene Cho. Ho Jin Choi. Devin R. Christian. Robert A. Clark. John M. Coniglio. Caroline R. Corcos, magna cum laude, public administration. Keegan J. Coughlin. Matthew B. Crouch. Alexander R. Kirtland. Jeffrey M. Dahlgren, cum laude. Camille L. Daly, cum laude, public administration. Christopher J. Davila. Brian J. Deaver. <laughs> Heather L. DeLauri. <laughs> Matt.
Matthew W. de Blasi. Andrew J. Di Pasquale. Amy G. Doan, summa cum laude. Ariana Doty. Brittany Drusher Bradkey, cum laude. Jessica E. Easterly, cum laude. Christer John Esguera. Christina M. Farrell, magna cum laude, Cultural Foundations of Education. Jesse M. Fitel, magna cum laude, Public Administration. Alexander Ferguson. Matthew J. Fox. Elizabeth L. Gaffney, magna cum laude. Crystal N. Garcia. Lacey A. Gem, magna cum laude. Candace E. Geller. Pauline Gazarian, Forensic Science. Jerry C. Giannakis. Jamie E. Glasho, magna cum laude, Cultural Foundations of Education. Joshua M. Goldstein, Public Administration. Tesla M. Goodrich. Ashley E. Goodwin. William O. Graves, cum laude. Zachary S. Greenberg, cum laude. Daniel S. Green. Sophia L. Gregg, Pro Bono Scholar. <laughs> Jessica L. Grimm, Cum Laude, International Relations. <laughs> Anne S. Bruner.
Anthony R. Gruner. Paul J. Gulamarian. Amanda Haas. David M. Hahn, Business Administration. Hillary C. Hall. Caitlin R. Hall. Carly J. Halpin, cum laude. Sammy Harmouche. Kyle M. Herda, Forensic Science. <laughs> Helen O. Honholt, International Relations. Arnold J. Hall. David F. Huber. Joseph A. Huckleberry, cum laude. Julie A. Hughes, Cum Laude, Public Administration. Elizabeth A. Hunt. Huang in me. <laughs> Joseph L. Ingrao. Selby L. Jason, magna cum laude. Christopher S. Jennison. Zachary D. Johnson, magna cum laude. Jacob M. Jones. Matthew R. Jones. Megan E. Boyce. Joyce. Megan E. Joyce. Shannon E. Kane. Jordan M. Kelly.
Lindsay M. Kelly. Ann C. Kana, cum laude. Christopher Kim. Ani Rudal Kinha. Brooke and Castor. Burke E. Kraus. Ronald S. Lee. Maria C. Lasinski, cum laude, television, radio, and film. Peter E. Levrant. Megan Liptak. Jeanette A. Luna, Public Administration. <laughs> Kyle Lundeen, Cum Laude, Public Administration. <laughs> Colin P. Lynch, Cum Laude, Forensic Science. Edwin A. Maldonado. Omnit Mand. Jean Michelle Mariani, cum laude, public administration. <laughs> Natalie Marin. Stacy A. Maris, cum laude, television, radio, and film. <laughs> Alexandra L. Martinez. Sarah E. McCreary, cum laude. Morgan C. McKinney, cum laude. Jordan M. Meeks. Catherine M. Miller. Ashley M. Monette, cum laude. Edward G. Monkman.
Delisa N. Morris, Public Relations. Matthew J. Musaccio. Matt F. Nashban, cum laude. Dana J. Nevins, summa cum laude, public administration. Aaron T. O'Brien. Joshua M. O'Neill, Pro Bono Scholar. Stephen M. Nelson. Michael C. Panabianco. Heather R. Parker. Keith A. Pedrani, magna cum laude, business administration. Khadija N. Peak, new media management. Alexandra O. Pietropaolo. Dennis W. Polio, magna cum laude, public administration. Corey M. Pranman, cum laude, computer science. Janshur Rasa. Farzad Rashidi. Ashley C. Rep, International Relations. Michael A. Roberts and Illy. Shannon M. Robin. Thomas R. Romano. Philip Ross. Stephen F. Rick, summa cum laude.
Corey John Schoonmaker, magna cum laude. Courtney M. Schott. Alec B. Schwartz. Jordan A. Sarah, Political Science. Ashley R. Skulky, Social Work. <laughs> David C. Smallwood, Political Science. <laughs> Kevin B. Smith, Magna Cum Laude. Rudolph Soul. <laughs> Nicholas A. Summers, magna cum laude. <laughs> Sarah K. Spencer, Forest Resources Management. <laughs> William B. Stevens, International Relations. Kyle R. Sutliff, summa cum laude. Jonathan M. Simer. Daniel Taroli, magna cum laude. Megan E. Tillman, Pro Bono Scholar. <laughs> Merdula Tirumalaseti. Ana Lucia Uritsa. Alejandra P. Valenzuela, International Relations. Ronald R. Valley. <laughs> Daniel J. Van Sant, cum laude, Cultural Foundations of Education. Kate M. Vandendolder. <laughs> Nicholas A. Vona. Kristen L. Warner, cum laude.
Alyssa M. Warpus. Ashley B. Weathers. Rachel O. Webster. Molly E. White. Benjamin R. Williams, cum laude. Claxon C. Wilson. Catherine H. Wiesner, Teaching and Curriculum. Martin P. Wolfson. Jessica L. Yannette, Forensic Science. I think one more time, yes, a round of applause for the graduates, LLMs and JDs. Now that the audience is standing, please remain standing for the alma mater and remain so until the recessional is complete. Gabriella Wolf will lead us in the alma mater.
2016 College of Law commencement ceremony is closed. Please join the class back at Deneen Hall immediately following the recessional for refreshments and a very nice uh, welcome for all the family members and friends. Thank you very much. Thank you. 